Stories of Futures Past presents Five Stories Featuring Automatons Road Stop by David Mason The Gun by Philip K. Dick The Fastest Draw by Larry Eisenberg Operation Lorelei by William P. Salton Watchbird by Robert Sheckley Road Stop by David Mason Originally published in Worlds of If Science Fiction, January 1963 Narrated by Tom Trussell It was like any other car on the road it was automatic, self-contained, and eternal. The highway stretched away in ruler-straight perspective towards both horizons, black and shining in the sun like a river of ink. Beside it, the bright pastel buildings of Rest Stop 25 stood among the green trees. Occasionally, a car shot past, a flash of metal and a hiss of split wind, but the road was one which was used more often at night and was nearly empty in the afternoon. Sam was the only attendant on duty. Stop 25 needed only two human attendants, even at its busiest hours. He sat, staring out at the highway, his elbows on the lunch counter, his round face blank, but his mouth set tightly. The phone at his elbow emitted a small grunting noise, you still there? The phone voice said inquiringly. Yeah, Sam said, still staring at the highway. Well, the voice paused. Look, it might not come your way. It usually turns west at the New Britain intersection. Not always, Sam said. It went by here once before. It almost never stops anyway, the voice said firmly. It won't stop. Sometimes it does. Sam said. It doesn't have to. Sam shrugged and said nothing. OK, then, the voice said. I called you about it anyway. Thanks. Sam turned away, still watching the road. Far off, a speck of metal gleamed, growing larger. The distant high sound of brakes began as a car decelerated, coming towards the stop. It was just an ordinary car, Sam told himself. That other car was still hundreds of miles away, but his hands were damp as he watched it grow larger. It was an ordinary Talman sedan, with two people in it. It swung into the stop's parking area, and its doors slid open smoothly. A small red light flashed on its arched front, the repair signal. In response, the doors of the repair shop opened. The Talman waited as a man and a woman emerged from its padded interior and moved slowly into the repair shop. The doors closed behind it. The couple came toward the restaurant where Sam stood waiting. Hi, the man said to Sam. Afternoon, Sam moved to the counter. Something to eat while you're waiting, folks. The tall, dark girl glanced out at the closed doors of the repair shop. How long's that car going to take? she asked in a tired voice. I wanted to get home tonight. Not long, Sam said. It didn't look like anything complicated. How can you tell? the man asked, sitting down. It could take all night. Like something to eat while you're waiting? Sam asked. The woman stared at the lunch racks critically. I never liked these places to eat in, the woman said, curling her lip. You never know how long the food's been stored in the robot. Oh, hell, Grace, the man said wearily. To Sam, he gave an apologetic shrug. Just coffee. Well, you don't know, the woman insisted. I mean, she watched Sam drawing the coffee into a cup. I used to cook a lot, by hand, till Jack had the auto kitchen put in. He never had any stomach trouble till then. It's getting so everything. Oh, I don't know. It's all out of reach. You don't know what's happening anymore, like the car. I wish I knew what she's talking about half the time, 
Jack said, blowing on his coffee. Sam leaned on the counter, looking past the couple toward the empty road. I know what the lady means, Sam said, almost to himself. You get to thinking. Well, I can remember when people used to drive their own cars, themselves, steering and everything, except on the biggest highways, and everything got done with people. People made things and cooked food and grew plants. Everybody was busy all the time. It was better then. The man called Jack shrugged. Sure, sure. Everybody always talks about the good old days, but I don't see many of them going to live in the woods, like Grace. She says she doesn't like the auto kitchen, but she uses it. It saves time, Grace said. I guess I will have copy too, mister. It saves time, she says, Jack said. For what? She's got too much time now. I wonder what it must have been like in the old days here, Grace said vaguely, staring around the lunchroom. Everybody running in and out, all the drivers, trucks, with men in them, the way you read about it in the historical novels, men that drove their own cars in all kinds of weather. Gee! Just like on TV, Sam said, grinning. I hope we get the car out of there pretty soon, Jack said anxiously. He glanced out toward the silent garage. I always wonder what would happen if the machinery stuck or something. How would you ever get your car out? It doesn't get stuck, Sam said. A peculiar look crossed his face as he added, Not any more. Did it ever? Sam shrugged. Oh well, you know, twenty or thirty years ago all this automatic stuff wasn't quite so good as it is now. Cars, repair shops, things went wrong sometimes. Like... Like the Traveller. The Traveller? The woman looked up. Oh, that's just a ghost story, like the Flying Dutchman, isn't it? The lunchroom was completely silent. Sam was no longer paying any attention to the couple sitting at the counter. He was close to the big window, standing stiffly, feet apart like an admiral on a ship's bridge, his eyes studying the empty horizon. There, where the lines of the road met with the precision of a drawing board exercise in perspective, he thought he saw a fleck of light. It isn't when it goes past, Sam said in a t quiet, tight voice. He talked at the window, his back to the other two. His words meant mostly for himself. It's not it's going by. That doesn't bother me, he repeated. It came by my old place five or six times, I remember. That's why I finally asked to be transferred out here, where it hardly ever goes by but I could have gotten used to it. I mean, you don't have to look at it or anything. It's just another car. Old, sure, but there's no difference. A car goes by, that's all. Only... You mean it's real? The woman asked in a low voice. Her husband's eyes were looking out toward the empty road following Sam's look. The traveller, he said without looking at his wife. Sure, it's real. Why do you think they don't make that model of car anymore? It's real. I knew somebody who saw it once. There might even be two or three travellers, Sam said, watching the distant glitter of light. There was certainly a car coming, just a car, although it was still too far away to tell for sure. A haunted car, the woman said, her eyes wider. Gee! It isn't a haunted car, her husband said. It's just one of the earliest makes of automatic highway cars. Everything automatic, steering, destination set, just like any car is nowadays, only it wasn't quite perfect somehow. They got into their car, Sam said, his eyes picking out distant microscopic details. The high flaring fins, the double headlamps, lit up, although it was broad daylight, on the road. He knew what the rest would be. It was moving so slowly, but it always moved slowly, barely thirty miles an hour, as if somebody wanted you to look and see. They just got in, the way anybody would do, Sam said. They set a destination, and the windows closed up, and the air conditioner went on, and the car went out on the road. Only it never got there, the other man said. 
wherever it was going to go. But, the woman looked puzzled, wouldn't anybody stop it? I mean, wouldn't it run out of fuel, or, well, how do the people get in it get out? It does just what any car does, her husband told her. It gets fuel when it needs it. You can't just stop a robot control device. Not till it's good and ready. But the people in it, she said, they'd starve or something. The car called the traveller, rolling at the stately thirty miles an hour it always held, was coming down the road now, and the two men stood watching. The woman, a little behind them, watched too, her face growing whiter. No one said anything as the old-fashioned car rolled by, straight and steady down the highway, holding the centre of the lane as sharply as it always did. There was a film of dust inside the windows, though the traveller was clean and shining outside. But the film did hide the white bone faces, the despairing hands that had long ago stopped trying to break through those closed windows. They never did get out, the man named Jack said, as the traveller rolled on, growing smaller along the endless road. I don't mind it when it goes past, Sam said, his voice thinner edged. I really don't. It's just a car. Things like that used to happen. I mean, it's a car. Even when it stops to get gas, I don't have to pay any attention. He looked at the couple, his mouth loose. As long as it just goes on, that's all right. But I keep thinking some day it'll stop, and the door will open, and maybe, maybe they'll want lunch. He giggled uncontrollably, and then choked it back. Outside, the big hangar doors of the repair shop opened. The car that had been inside appeared. It moved out and stopped, its doors open invitingly. Your car's ready now, Sam told the couple. So long, folks. Have a nice trip. The End Subscribe for your daily stories of futures past. And now, for the next story. The Gun by Philip K. Dick Originally published in Planet Stories, September 1952 Narrated by Tom Trussell The captain peered into the eyepiece of the telescope. He adjusted the focus quickly. It was an atomic fission we saw all right, he said presently. He sighed and pushed the eyepiece away. Any of you who wants to look may do so, but it's not a pretty sight. Let me look, Tance the archaeologist said. He bent down to look, squinting. Good Lord! He leapt violently back, knocking against Dahl, the chief navigator. Why did we come all this way, then? Dahl asked, looking around at the other men. There's no point even in landing. Let's go back at once. Perhaps he's right, the biologist murmured but I'd like to look for myself, if I may. He pushed past Tance and peered into the sight. He saw a vast expanse, an endless surface of grey, stretching to the edge of the planet. At first he thought it was water, but after a moment he realised it was slag, pitted, fused slag, broken only by hills of rock jutting up at intervals. Nothing moved or stirred. Everything was silent, dead. I see, Fomar said, backing away from the eyepiece. Well, I don't find any legumes there. He tried to smile, but his lips stayed unmoved. He stepped away and stood by himself, staring past the others. I wonder what the atmospheric sample will show, Tance said. I think I can guess. The captain answered, Most of the atmosphere is poisoned. But didn't we expect all this? I don't see why we're so surprised. A fission visible as far away as our system must be a terrible thing. He strode off down the corridor, dignified and expressionless. They watched him disappear into the control room. As the captain closed the door, the young woman turned. 
What did the telescope show? Good or bad? Bad. No life could possibly exist. Atmosphere poisoned, water vaporised, all the land fused. Could they have gone underground? The captain slid back the port window so that the surface of the planet under them was visible. The two of them stared down, silent and disturbed. Mile after mile of unbroken ruin stretched out, blackened slag, pitted and scarred, and occasional heaps of rock. Suddenly Nasha jumped. Look, over there, at the edge. Do you see it? They stared. Something rose up. Not rock, not an accidental formation. It was round, a circle of dots, white pellets on the dead skin of the planet. A city? Buildings of some kind? Please turn the ship, Nasha said excitedly. She pushed her dark hair from her face. Turn the ship, let's see what it is. The ship turned, changing its course. As they came over the white dots, the captain lowered the ship, dropping it down as much as he dared. Piers, he said, piers of some sort of stone, perhaps poured artificial stone, the remains of a city. Oh dear, Nasha murmured, how awful. She watched the ruins disappear behind them. In a half-circle the white squares jutted from the slag, chipped and cracked, like broken teeth. "'There's nothing alive,' the captain said at last. "'I think we'll go right back. I know most of the crew want to. Get the government receiving station on the sender, and tell them what we found, and that we—' "'He's staggered. The first atomic shell had struck the ship, spinning it around.' The captain fell to the floor, crashing into the control table. Papers and instruments rained down on him. As he started to his feet, the second shell struck. The ceiling cracked open, struts and girders twisted and bent. The ship shuddered, falling suddenly down, then righting itself as automatic controls took over. The captain lay on the floor by the smashed control board. In the corner, Nasha struggled to free herself from the debris. Outside the men were already sealing the gaping leaks in the side of the ship, through which the precious air was rushing, dissipating into the void beyond. "'Help me!' Dahl was shouting. "'Fire over here! Wiring ignited!' Two men came running. Tarns watched helplessly, his eyeglasses broken and bent. "'So there is life here, after all,' he said, half to himself. "'But how could—' "'Give us a hand,' Fomar said, hurrying past. "'Give us a hand. We've got to land the ship.' It was night. A few stars glinted above them, winking through the drifting silt that blew across the surface of the planet. Dole peered out, frowning. "'What a place to be stuck in!' He resumed his work, hammering the bent metal hull of the ship back into place. He was wearing a pressure suit. There were still many small leaks— and radioactive particles from the atmosphere had already found their way into the ship. Nasha and Fomar were sitting at the table in the control room, pale and solemn, studying the inventory lists. "'Low on carbohydrates,' Fomar said. "'We can break down the stored fats if we want to, but—' "'I wonder if we could find anything outside,' Nasha went to the window. "'How uninviting it looks!' She paced back and forth, very slender and small, her face dark with fatigue. "'What do you suppose an exploring party would find?' Fomar shrugged. "'Not much. Maybe a few weeds growing in cracks here and there. Nothing we could use. Anything that would adapt to this environment would be toxic, lethal.' Nasha paused, rubbing her cheek. There was a deep scratch there, still red and swollen. Then how do you explain it? According to your theory, the inhabitants must have died in their skins, fried like yams. But who fired on us? Somebody detected us, made a decision, aimed a gun. And gauged a distance, the captain said feebly from the cot in the corner. He turned toward them. That's the part that worries me. The first shell put us out of commission. The second almost destroyed us. They were well aimed, perfectly aimed. We're not such an easy target. True, Fomar nodded. 
Well, perhaps we'll know the answer before we leave here. What a strange situation. All our reasoning tells us that no life could exist. The whole planet burned dry. The atmosphere itself gone, completely poisoned. The gun that fired the projectile survived, Nasha said. Why not people? It's not the same. Metal doesn't need air to breathe. Metal doesn't get leukaemia from radioactive particles. Metal doesn't need food and water. There was silence. A paradox, Nasha said. Anyhow, in the morning I think we should send out a search party. And meanwhile, we should keep on trying to get the ship in condition for the trip back. It'll be days before we can take off, Fomar said. We should keep every man working here. We can't afford to send out a party. Nasha smiled a little. We'll send you in the first party. Maybe you can discover. What was it you were so interested in? Legumes. Edible legumes. Maybe you can find some of them. Only... Only what? Only watch out. They fired on us once without even knowing who we were or what we came for. Do you suppose they fought with each other? Perhaps they couldn't imagine anyone being friendly under any circumstances. What a strange evolutionary trait, interspecies warfare, fighting within the race. We'll know in the morning, Fomar said. Let's get some sleep. The sun came up, chill and austere. The three people, two men and a woman, stepped through the port, dropping down on the hard ground below. What a day, Dahl said grumpily. I said how glad I'd be to walk on firm ground again, but... Come on, Nasha said. Up beside me. I want you to say something to you. Will you excuse us, Tans? Tans nodded gloomily. Dahl caught up with Nasha. They walked together, the metal shoes crunching the ground underfoot. Nasha glanced at him. Listen, the captain is dying. No one knows except the two of us. By the end of the day period of this planet he'll be dead. The shock did something to his heart. He was almost sixty, you know. Dahl nodded. That's bad. I have a great deal of respect for him. You will be captain in his place, of course, since you're vice-captain now. No. I prefer to see someone else lead. Perhaps you, or Fomar. I've been thinking over the situation, and it seems to me that I should declare myself mated to one of you, whichever of you wants to be captain. Then I could devolve the responsibility. Well, I don't want to be captain. Let Fomar do it. Nasha studied him, tall and blonde, striding along beside her in his pressure suit. I'm rather partial to you, she said. We might try it for a time, at least. But do as you like. Look, we're coming to something. They stopped walking, letting Tans catch up. In front of them was some sort of ruined building. Dahl stared around thoughtfully. Do you see? This whole place is a natural bowl, a huge valley. See how the rock formations rise up on all sides, protecting the floor. Maybe some of the great blast was deflected here. They wandered around the ruins, picking up rocks and fragments. I think this was a farm, Tans said, examining a piece of wood. This was part of a tower windmill. Really? Nasha took the stick and turned it over. Interesting. But let's go, we don't have much time. Look, Dahl said suddenly, off there, a long way off. Isn't that something? He pointed. Nasha sucked in her breath. The white stones. What? Nasha looked up at Dahl. The white stones, the great broken teeth. We saw them, the captain and I, from the control room. She touched Dahl's arm gently. That's where they fired from. I didn't think we had landed so close. What is it? Tan said, coming up to them. I'm almost blind without my glasses. What do you see? The city, where they fired from. Oh. All three of them stood together. Well, let's go, Tan said. There's no telling what we'll find there. Dahl frowned at him. Wait. We don't know what we would be getting into. They must have patrols. They probably have seen us already, for that matter. 
They probably have seen the ship itself, Tance said. They probably know right now where they can find it, where they can blow it up. So what differences does it make whether we go closer or not? That's true, Nasha said. If they really want to get us, we haven't a chance. We have no armaments at all. You know that. I have a hand weapon, Dahl nodded. Well, let's go on then. I suppose you're right, Tans. But let's stay together, Tans said nervously. Nasha, you're going too fast. Nasha looked back. She laughed. If we expect to get there by nightfall, we must go fast. They reached the outskirts of the city at about the middle of the afternoon. The sun, cold and yellow, hung above them in the colourless sky. Dahl stopped at the top of a ridge overlooking the city. Well, there it is. What's left of it? There was not much left. The huge concrete piers which they had noticed were not piers at all, but the ruined foundations of buildings. They had been baked by the searing heat, baked and charred almost to the ground. Nothing else remained, only this irregular circle of white squares, perhaps four miles in diameter. Dahl spat in disgust. More wasted time. A dead skeleton of a city, that's all. But it was from here that the firing came, Tance murmured. Don't forget that. And by someone with a good eye and a great deal of experience, Nasha added. Let's go. They walked into the city between the ruined buildings. No one spoke. They walked in silence, listening to the echo of the footsteps. It's macabre, Dahl muttered. I've seen ruined cities before, but they died of old age, old age and fatigue. This was killed, seared to death. This city didn't die. It was murdered. I wonder what the city was called, Nasha said. She turned aside, going up the remains of a stairway from one of the foundations. Do you think we might find a signpost, some kind of plaque? She peered into the ruins. There's nothing there, Dahl said impatiently. Come on. Wait. Nasha bent down, touching a concrete stone. There's something inscribed on this. What is it? Tans hurried up. He squatted in the dust, running his gloved fingers of the surface of the stone. Letters all right. He took a writing stick from the pocket of his pressure suit and copied the inscription on a bit of paper. Dahl glanced over his shoulder. The inscription was, Franklin Apartments. That's the city, Nasha said softly. That was its name. Tans put the paper in his pocket, and they went on. After a time, Dahl said, Nasha, you know I think we're being watched, but don't look around. The woman stiffened. Oh, why do you say that? Did you see something? No, I can feel it, though. Don't you? Nasha smiled a little. I feel nothing, but perhaps I'm more used to being stared at. She turned her head slightly. Oh! Dahl reached for his hand weapon. What is it? What do you see? Tans had stopped dead in his tracks, his mouth half open. The gun, Nasha said. It's the gun. Look at the size of it. The size of the thing. Dahl unfastened his hand weapon slowly. That's it, all right. The gun was huge, stark and immense. It pointed up at the sky, a mass of steel and glass set in a huge slab of concrete. Even as they watched, the gun moved on its swivel base, whirring underneath. A slim vane turned with the wind, a network of rods atop a high pole. It's alive, Nasha whispered. It's listening to us, watching us. The gun moved again, this time clockwise. It was mounted so that it could make a full circle. The barrel lowered a trifle, then resumed its original position. But who fires it? Tans said. Dahl laughed. No one, no one fires it. They stared at him. 
What do you mean? It fires itself. They couldn't believe him. Nasha came close to him, frowning, looking up at him. I don't understand. What do you mean it fires itself? Watch. I'll show you. Don't move. Dahl picked up a rock from the ground. He hesitated a moment, and then tossed the rock high in the air. The rock passed in front of the gun. Instantly the great barrel moved, the veins contracted. The rock fell to the ground. The gun paused, then resumed its calm swivel, its slow circling. "'You see,' Dahl said, "'it noticed the rock. As soon as I threw it up in the air, it's alert to anything that flies or moves above the ground level. Probably it detected us as soon as we entered the gravitational field of the planet. It probably had a bead on us from the start. We don't have a chance. It knows all about the ship. It's just waiting for us to take off again. I understand about the rock, Nasha said, nodding. The gun noticed it, but not us, since we're on the ground, not above. It's only designed to combat objects in the sky. The ship is safe until it takes off again. Then the end will come. But what's this gun for? Tans put in. There's no one alive here. Everyone is dead. It's a machine, Dahl said. A machine that was made to do a job. And it's doing the job. How it survived the blast, I don't know. On it goes, waiting for the enemy. Probably they came by air in some sort of projectiles. The enemy, Nasha said. Their own race. It is hard to believe that they really bombed themselves, fired at themselves. Well, it's over with. Except right here, where we're standing. This one gun, still alert, ready to kill. It'll go on until it wears out. And by that time we'll be dead. "'Nasha said bitterly. "'There must have been hundreds of guns like this,' Dahl murmured. "'They must have been used to the sight. "'Guns, weapons, uniforms. "'Probably they accepted it as a natural thing, part of their lives, "'like eating and sleeping. "'An institution, like the church and the state. "'Men trained to fight, to lead armies. "'A regular profession. "'Honoured, respected.' Tance was walking slowly toward the gun, peering near-sightedly up at it. Quite complex, isn't it? All those veins and tubes. I suppose this is some sort of telescopic sight. His gloved hand touched the end of a long tube. Instantly the gun shifted, the barrel retracting. It swung. Don't move! Dahl cried. The barrel swung past them as they stood, rigid and still. For one terrible moment it hesitated over the heads, clicking and whirring, settling into position. Then the sounds died out, and the gun became silent. Tans smiled foolishly inside his helmet. I must have put my finger over the lens. I'll be more careful. He made his way up onto the circular slab, stepping gingerly behind the body of the gun. He disappeared from view. Where did he go? Nasha said irritably. He'll get us all killed. Tans, come back, Dahl shouted. What's the matter with you? In a minute. There was a long silence. At last the archaeologist appeared. I think I've found something. Come up and I'll show you. What is it? Dahl, you said the gun was here to keep the enemy off. I think I know why they wanted to keep the enemy off. They were puzzled. I think I've found what the gun is supposed to guard. Come and give me a hand. All right, Dahl said abruptly. Let's go. He seized Nasha's hand. Come on, let's see what he's found. I thought something like this might happen when I saw that the gun was... Like what? Nasha pulled her hand away. What are you talking about? You act as if you knew what he's found. I do, Dahl smiled down at her. Do you remember the legend that all races have, the myth of the buried treasure, and the dragon, the serpent that watches it, guards it, keeping everyone away? She nodded. Well? Dahl pointed up at the gun. 
That, he said, is the dragon. Come on. Between the three of them, they managed to pull up the steel cover and lay it to one side. Dahl was wet with perspiration when they finished. It isn't worth it, he grunted. He stared into the dark, yawning hole. Or is it? Nasha clicked on a hand lamp, shining the beam down the stairs. The steps were thick with dust and rubble. At the bottom was a steel door. Come on, Tarn said excitedly. He started down the stairs. They watched him reach the door and pull hopefully on it without success. Give a hand! All right. They came gingerly after him. Dahl examined the door. It was bolted shut, locked. There was an inscription on the door, but he could not read it. Now what? Nasha said. Dahl took out his hand weapon. Stand back. I can't think of any other way. He pressed the switch. The bottom of the door glowed red. Presently it began to crumble. Dahl clicked the weapon off. I think we can get through. Let's try. The door came apart easily. In a few minutes they had carried it away in pieces and stacked the pieces on the first step. Then they went on, flashing the light ahead of them. They were in a vault. Dust lay everywhere, on everything, inches thick. Wood crates lined the walls, huge boxes and crates, packages and containers. Tance looked around curiously, his eyes bright. "'What exactly are all these?' he murmured. "'Something valuable, I would think.' He picked up a round drum and opened it. A spool fell to the floor, unwinding a black ribbon. He examined it, holding it up to the light. "'Look at this!' They came around him. "'Pictures!' Nasha said. "'Tiny pictures!' "'Records of some kind.' Tarns closed the spool up and the drum again. Look, hundreds of drums. He flashed the light around. And those crates, let's open one. Dahl was already prying at the wood. The wood had turned brittle and dry. He managed to pull a section away. It was a picture. A boy in a blue garment, smiling pleasantly, staring ahead, young and handsome. He seemed almost alive ready to move toward them in the light of the hand-lamp. It was one of them, one of the ruined race, the race that had perished. For a long time they stared at the picture. At last a doll replaced the board. All these other crates, Nasha said. More pictures. And these drums? What are in the boxes? This is their treasure, Tan said almost to himself. Here are their pictures, their records. Probably all their literature is here, their stories, their myths, their ideas about the universe. And their history, Nasha said. We'll be able to trace their development and find out what it was that made them become what they were. Dahl was wandering around the vault. Odd, he murmured. Even at the end, even after they had begun to fight, they still knew some place down inside them, that their real treasure was this, their books and pictures, their myths. Even after their big cities and buildings and industries were destroyed, they probably hoped to come back and find this, after everything else was gone. When we get back home, we can agitate for a mission to come here, Tan said. All this can be loaded up and taken back. We'll be leaving about... He stopped. Yes, Dahl said dryly. We'll be leaving about three day periods from now. We'll fix the ship, then take off. Soon we'll be home, that is, if nothing happens. Like being shot down by that. Oh, stop it, Nasha said impatiently. Leave him alone. He's right. All this must be taken back home sooner or later. We'll have to solve the problem of the gun. We have no choice. Dahl nodded. What's your solution, then? As soon as we leave the ground, we'll be shot down. His face twisted bitterly. They've guarded their treasure too well. Instead of being preserved, it will lie here until it rots. It serves them right. How? Don't you see? This was the only way they knew, building a gun, 
and setting it up to shoot anything that came along. They were so certain that everything was hostile, the enemy coming to take their possessions away from them. Well, they can keep them. Nasha was deep in thought, her mind far away. Suddenly she gasped. Doll, she said, what's the matter with us? We have no problem. The gun is no menace at all. The two men stared at her. No menace, Doll said. It's already shot us down once, and as soon as we take off again... <laughs> Don't you see? Nasha began to laugh. The poor foolish gun is completely harmless. Even I could deal with it alone. You? Her eyes were flashing. With a crowbar, with a hammer, or a stick of wood. Let's go back to the ship and load up. Of course we're at its mercy in the air. That's the way it was made. It can fire into the sky, shoot down anything that flies. But that's all. Against something on the ground it has no defences. Isn't that right? Dahl nodded slowly. The soft underbelly of the dragon. In the legend, the dragon's armour doesn't cover its stomach. He began to laugh. That's right. That's perfectly right. Let's go then, Nasha said. Let's get back to the ship. We have work to do here. It was early the next morning when they reached the ship. During the night the captain had died, and the crew had ignited his body according to custom. They had stood solemnly around it until the last ember died. As they were going back to their work, the woman and the two men appeared, dirty and tired, still excited. And presently, from the ship, a line of people came, each carrying something in its hands. The line marched across the grey slag, the eternal expanse of fused metal. When they reached the weapon, they all fell on the gun at once, with crowbars, hammers, anything that was heavy and hard. The telescopic sights shattered into bits, the wiring was pulled out, torn to shreds, the delicate gears were smashed, dented. Finally, the warheads themselves were carried off and the firing pins removed. The gun was smashed, the great weapon destroyed. The people went down into the vault and examined the treasure. With its metal armoured guardian dead, there was no danger any longer. They studied the pictures, the films, the crates of books, the jewelled crowns, the cups, the statues. At last, as the sun was dipping into the grey mists that drifted across the planet, they came back up the stairs again. For a moment, they stood around the wrecked gun, looking at the unmoving outline of it. Then they started back to the ship. There was still much work to be done. The ship had been badly hurt, much had been damaged and lost. The important thing was to repair it as quickly as possible, to get it into the air. With all of them working together, it took just five more days to make it space-worthy. Nasha stood in the control room, watching the planet fall away behind them. She folded her arms, sitting down on the edge of the table. "'What are you thinking?' Dahl said. "'I? Nothing. Are you sure?' "'I was thinking that there must have been a time when this planet was quite different, when there was life on it.' "'I suppose there was. It's unfortunate that no ships from our system came this far.' but then we had no reason to suspect intelligent life until we saw the fission glow in the sky. And then it was too late. Not quite too late. After all, their possessions, their music, books, their pictures, all of that will survive. We'll take them home and study them, and they'll change us. We won't be the same afterwards. Their sculpturing especially— did you see the one of the great winged creature, without a head or arms? Broken off, I suppose. But those wings, it looked very old. It will change us a great deal. When we come back, we won't find the gun waiting for us, Nasha said. Next time it won't be there to shoot us down. We can land and take the treasure, as you call it. She smiled up at Dahl. You'll lead us back there as a good captain should. 
Captain, Dole grinned. Then you've decided. Nasha shrugged. Fomar argues with me too much, I think. All in all, I really prefer you. Then let's go, Dole said. Let's go back home. The ship roared up, flying over the ruins of the city. It turned in a huge arc and then shot off beyond the horizon, heading into outer space. Down below, in the centre of the ruined city, a single half-broken detector vane moved slightly, catching the roar of the ship. The base of the great gun throbbed painfully, straining to turn. After a moment, a red warning light flashed on down inside its destroyed works, and a long way off, a hundred miles from the city, another warning light flashed on, far underground. Automatic relays flew into action, gears turned, belts whined. On the ground above a section of metal slag slipped back, a ramp appeared. A moment later a small cart rushed to the surface. The cart turned toward the city. A second cart appeared behind it. It was loaded with wiring cables. Behind it a third cart came, loaded with telescopic tube sights. And behind came more carts, some with relays, some with firing controls, some with tools and parts, screws and bolts, pins and nuts. The final one contained atomic warheads. The carts lined up behind the first one, the lead cart. The lead cart started off, across the frozen ground, bumping calmly along, followed by the others, moving toward the city, to the damaged gun. The End Subscribe for your daily stories of futures past. And now, for the next story. The Fastest Draw by Larry Eisenberg Originally published in Amazing Stories, January 1964 Narrated by Tom Trisser Like most men, Amos Handworthy was a creature of many parts. To his business associates, he was a sober, calculating entrepreneur, given occasionally to rash ventures which through outrageous turns of luck usually ended well. To his employees he was a distant, ominous figure, wandering through his electronics plant occasionally, staring with pale blue eyes at a myriad of trivial details, sifting through the reject box of discarded transistors and occasionally stopping to ask a loaded but seemingly innocuous question of one of the production engineers. To his housekeeper, he was a brusque, harsh man, not given overly to entertaining or keeping late hours, but sober, sedate, and completely absorbed in his pervasive habit of collecting automata. Very few men had ever seen the eyes of Amos Handworthy come aglow, and Manny Steinberg was one of them. Manny was a superb engineer who combined the ability to carry out a sophisticated circuit design with the old-fashioned desire to tinker. It was almost physically painful for him to pass by a mechanical device that was not in working order. And so, in his first visit to the Pecos Saloon, a town landmark that had been restored to its pristine decor through the generosity of Amos Handworthy, Manny caught sight of the magnificent music-making machine as soon as he cut through the swinging doors. He proceeded first to the bar and availed himself of the tequila and lemon juice which was a specialty of the house. Much of the town showed the influence of its close location to the Mexican border, the large Spanish-speaking population, the frijoles that were vended off street carts and the tastes in liquor. Still sucking on the lemon, Manny walked over and surveyed the glass-enclosed music-maker, four vertical violins arrayed in a circle with a hoop of horsehair spanning about the four violin bridges, electromagnet stops hovering above the strings. A dried-out square of paper had been crudely taped across the glass with a clear inked inscription, 
out of order. He had removed the back door of the machine and was examining the innards when he felt a proprietary hand on his shoulder and swivelled about to meet the questioning gaze of his boss, Amos Handworthy. "'I think I can make it go,' said Manny, not certain what that he could, but unable to leave his marvellous array of gears, levers, and multi-pinned rotating discs. "'I tried to have it repaired and failed,' said Amos Handworthy. "'But if you can do it, it's worth a thousand dollars to me.' Manny nodded, as though this offer had tipped the balance, but in truth it made very little difference to him. Even the following week, when he demonstrated to a full saloon how beautifully the four violins played the Mephisto waltz, he accepted the cheque which Amos Handworthy placed in his hand with some puzzlement, not quite connecting it with the maintenance miracle he had just wrought. Handworthy insisted on having the machine play again and again, but after the fourth successful round, Manny had lost interest in the device and was more concerned in downing tequilas than in listening to the music. Later that night, as he lay abed on the rumpled, sweat-wet sheet, wondering how in hell he had taken a job in this godforsaken town in Texas, he remembered dimly that his boss, Mr. Handworthy, had invited him over to the stately Handworthy mansion. He was not sure when the invitation was for, or whether the occasion was of a business or social character, but he knew that it was mandatory that he come. Fortunately, a handwritten note on grey, unembossed letter paper arrived the following day, confirming the invitation and specifying a dinner date the following Friday evening at 8 p.m. Manny's income was a good one, and he had eaten in some of the finest restaurants in the country, but had never been to the home of a truly wealthy man before. It was with no little trepidation that he appeared at the door of the Handworthy Mansion, and was ushered into the house by the liveried butler who was, to Manny's intense surprise, white. He was somewhat taken aback to find that he was the only dinner guest, and that the burden of making conversation would be totally his job. But he found that, contrary to his expectation, Amos Handworthy did almost all of the talking. The food was plentiful, but not lavish or exotic in character. Mr. Handworthy himself carved out liberal slices of the huge side of beef that was brought in on a great silver salver, and although Mr. Handworthy did not drink it, the wine was carefully chilled, and of good, but not the best, quality. Since Manny had been raised in a low-income Jewish inhabited section of New York City, and had, despite his extensive rootless shifting about the country, no real insight into how anybody else lived, he found himself quite taken with the rambling tales that Amos Handworthy told of his town's history. "'My father,' said Amos Handworthy toward the close of the dinner, "'was one of the last frontier marshals, and maybe the greatest. "'His draw was reputed to be so fast that the eye could barely follow it, "'and he never missed his target. "'But he drank like a fish,' he thought and spent most of his time at the sporting house on East Maple. As a boy, he said aloud, I could think of nothing more ideal than to follow in his footsteps when I grew up. Of course, when I had grown up, there was no more frontier, no more showdowns in the centre of town. It was a terrible disappointment, and one that I haven't gotten over, even yet. My father, said Manny pensively, claimed that I had a clumsy wooden hands. He was wrong, and I think he knew it, but he'd never admit it to me. "'Do you know what disturbs me?' said Amos Handworthy. "'There have been challenges for me, some financial, some physical, others social, and I've met and beaten every one of them. But I've never been in the same mother-naked kind of situation my father had to meet where it was one man's raw courage and skill against another's. The thing that disturbs me, said Manny, is that whenever I knock off a particularly tough job, instead of being elated, I'm totally depressed until the next challenging one comes along. Amos Handworthy raised the wine bottle to the light, 
and studied the play of colour through the thickened glass. "'Come inside,' he said abruptly. "'I've got something special I want to show you.' Manny followed after his host, and found himself in a huge high-ceilinged room flanked on all four walls by reward posters, some as much as one hundred years old. There were no furnishings in the room, just a series of unusual pieces of furniture that proved on closer scrutiny to be automata of diverse types. In the centre of the room was a great amorphous mass covered by an enormous sheet. "'I have no kin,' said Handworthy, staring possessively about him. "'I've never married, so I have no children. "'But I'm a happy man, nevertheless. "'These are my children,' he said, gesticulating about him. "'This one is a particular delight,' he added, "'his voice swelling with pride as he brought Manny over for a closer view.' It was a grey enamelled case, surmounted by a glistening blue hemisphere, adorned with tiny stars of silver and gold. Within the hemisphere was an exquisite miniature ballroom, the walls lined with mirrors, and when Handworthy wound up the movement and released the catch, the two groups of tiny dancers began to waltz toward each other. Their images were caught up and multiplied in hundredfold in the mirrors, creating a truly breathtaking sight as the unseen strings of a harp were plucked below in the grey enamelled case. Before Manny could comment, he was whisked over to a superbly crafted wooden figure of a charming child, a painted smile wreathing the gently carved mouth. The child was seated on a mahogany stool, and when the latching hook had been lowered, it leaned forward, and after dipping a feathered pen into an inkwell, began to write in smooth, cursive flow. When she leaned back, her motions apparently brought to a close. Manny bent forward, and found his intense amazement a beautifully crafted letter of some fifty words written to the mother of the child. There were other amazing sights, an android that fingered and breathed wind into a flute that played sweetly, a reclining Cleopatra that rose, bowed gravely at the waist, and then lay down once more upon her feathered couch. Since each of the treasured machines was in perfect functioning order, Manny rapidly lost interest, and merely followed Handworthy about, nodding politely, his mind distant upon a persistent circuit problem that was still unsolved. But it was jarred back to reality when, with a reverence that one would use to lay bare a sleeping nymph, Handworthy removed the sheet from the huge centerpiece of the room. It was a small segment of a western street, complete with hitching post, before which stood an uncanny lifelike figure of a town marshal, complete with vest and badge, chaps and holstered gun. The painted face was scowling, and from closer scrutiny it was apparent that the figure was capable of complex motion. "'The others,' said Amos Handworthy, "'are marvellous antiques that I've collected. "'But this fellow was made to my own specifications in Switzerland. "'His clothing is quite authentic, and he really works. "'Watch this.' "'He stepped forward and took a loosely draped gun-belt "'off the hitching post to the right of the marshal "'and buckled it about his waist. "'The device is electrically operated,' he continued, the instant I draw, the marshal draws too, and the trick is to hit him somewhere on his target photocells with a beam of light that flashes out of my gun before he can get off his shot. I can adjust the speed of his draw within fairly wide limits, and I've been moving him up to faster and faster speeds. But I've gotten pretty damn fast. With a drawing motion that was almost a blur, he whipped out his gun and pulled the trigger. The marshal was fast, but apparently not as fast, for suddenly a recorded voice bellowed in pain and gasped, "'You got me, you dirty varmint!' "'A little touch of my own,' said Amos Handworthy. "'That's what happens when I hit him.' He looked down at his gun, almost proudly, and Manny had the eerie feeling that was only with restraint that he did not blow the imaginary smoke away from the gun barrel." "'That's a highly imaginative device,' said Manny. 
He is, said Amos Handworthy, but he is still not quite what I want him to be. I have an idea that you can make him the kind of opponent I need. What do you want? said Manny. All of his ennui was beginning to evaporate, and the familiar exultant response to challenge had begun to grow in him. "'I want him to be able to hit me, too, figuratively speaking,' said Amos Handworthy. "'As things stand now, this shootout is entirely one-sided. "'I'd like to know, for instance, if he's been able to hit me.' "'I can do it,' said Manny. "'You'll have to get me off my regular project, but I can do it.' "'I'll call your division chief in the morning,' said Amos Handworthy. You'll stay here with me, and you can have all the time you need. Manny did not sleep well in his spacious, overly comfortable bed. He was up early the following morning, poring over the construction plans for the marshal, and examining the instruction folder which the Swiss company, with typical thoroughness, had included in the neatly packaged maintenance kit. He caught the guiding concept of the design at once, and made his plans to modify the marshal along lines that incorporated control techniques that were basically electronic. He phoned the plant, and requisitioned transistors, metal film resistors, capacitors, and various other components necessary for his task. Handworthy did not approach him as he worked, and his meals were served to him either in his own room or the great room where all the automata were located. He made all the changes himself, snipping leads, soldering, forming tight mechanical joints with deft fingers that almost seemed alive and apart from his body. Ten days later, he called in Amos Handworthy and demonstrated what he had done. "'I've modified both guns so that you and the marshal will now shoot at each other with ultraviolet light. You'll both wear vests that are sensitive to this light.' I monitor the hits electrically by measuring the resistance of those areas where a bullet would severely injure a man. Nothing will occur unless you or the marshal are hit in such an area. Furthermore, you can both continue to shoot for an indefinite length of time. However, I have altered the marshal's aiming mechanism so that if he is hit in a vital spot, he won't shoot as accurately. Similarly, if you are hit, a defocusing mechanism operates on a light bulb so that your gun is no longer as accurate, and instead of the recorded voice, if either of you is hit in the heart, your gun goes dead. Amos Handworthy's eyes began to glow with a fire such as Manny Steinberg had never seen, and it excited him that his work had brought on so wonderful a response. He slipped the new vest on Handworthy, handed him the wired holster and gun, and stepped back. After fastening his belt and readying himself, Handworthy drew as before, and fired swiftly at the marshal, who was firing back almost as rapidly. Suddenly Handworthy stopped and looked at his gun in dismay. "'My trigger's locked!' he cried. "'He's killed you,' said Manny dryly. "'You beat him to the draw, but he's hit you in the heart.' "'I see,' said Handworthy slowly. "'Then it looks like I've got a hell of a lot more practising to do.' It was a full month before Manny Steinberg was invited back to the mansion, and with great pride his host demonstrated how he killed the marshal every time. "'I've got him set for his fastest draw, too,' said Handworthy. "'At this point he's just no match for me.' "'I guess that wraps it up,' said Manny, knowing full well that it couldn't end this way. "'You're just too damned good.' Amos Handworthy shook his head slowly. "'You don't believe that, and neither do I. It is an unfair battle. Unfair because we've excluded the most vital element of all.' "'What element is that?' said Manny, although the answer popped into his head even as he spoke and he began to envision the approach that had to be taken. "'There's no fear in this situation,' said Handworthy. "'When two men were in an actual shootout, they were both afraid of being killed. "'But the marshal is oblivious to fear, 
and so for the most part am I. Suppose, for instance, in some way you could make him shoot better if I were nervous, and shoot less accurately if I were deadly calm. There is a way to do that, said Manny. I can electrically monitor your vasomotor reflexes by means of your pulse and sweat reactions. Then I would program the marshal's reflexes in just the way you suggest. But the thing I can't understand is how such a step would have any real meaning. Why in God's name would you ever be frightened? There's nothing in this situation to make it happen. I have a very vivid imagination, said Handworthy. As a child I had no playmates, and still I populated an entire world in my mind, every one a distinct person. Don't you see? I can project myself into feeling that I'm in the real life-and-death situation just as long as the marshal becomes a creature sensitive to fear. It took Manny almost three weeks this time to make the requisite changes, and he carried out in addition an extensive series of pulse and skin resistance measurements on Handworthy. When he was satisfied that the marshal had reached the ultimate state, he called in Handworthy and remonstrated what he had done. "'I've installed,' said Manny, "'a feedback circuit that's inoperative when your typical emotional reaction exists. But the circuit comes into play when you become more nervous than usual, and the marshal will therefore shoot faster and more accurately. On the other hand, if you should become less concerned, calmer perhaps, the marshal's aim would tend to go askew, and his firing rate would slow down. In other words, you and the marshal are indissolubly linked through your nervous system whenever you strap on your shooting vest. Fine, said Amos Handworthy, and the brilliance of his usually lacklustre eyes gave an added emphasis to the word. You have surpassed my greatest expectations with these new changes, and while I know it wasn't part of our bargain, I intend to add a pretty big sum to your monthly cheque. Thanks, said Manny automatically. Already he was becoming aware of the depression that followed his engineering triumphs. As he left the house, he had almost completely lost interest in his accomplishment. Meanwhile, Amos Handworthy was examining the guns with great care, particularly the tiny switch that activated the firing cycle. It was evident to him that as soon as his gun lifted off the switch, electrical activity commenced. After first unplugging the marshal's electrical cable, he carefully removed the ultraviolet loaded guns from the fixture in his holster and the marshal's holster, and replaced them with beautifully machined Colt forty fives that were loaded with real bullets. There's absolutely no doubt that the mechanical action will be the same, thought Handworthy, and now the element of real fear, both mine and his, will be in the picture. We are going to have a real shootout, the kind you don't see any more. He replaced the plug in the wall socket, and turned about to face the marshal quite squarely, shifting his belt around so that his gun would clear free of the holster. The marshal stared at him out of sightless painted blue eyes, his mechanical hand resting stolidly on his gun. Even now it isn't an even match, thought Handworthy ruefully. I couldn't be any calmer than I am now. I guess it never can come out just exactly as I want it to. As his fingers flashed lightning fast to his gun, it suddenly occurred to him that Manny was right, that he and the marshal were indissolubly linked through his own nervous system. He had no kin, no wife no children. The marshal was the only one on earth really tied to him, and in that instant a terrible surge of fear came over him at the thought of killing his own. The End Subscribe for your daily stories of futures past, and now for the next story. Operation Lorelei 
by William P. Salton, originally published in Amazing Stories, March 1954, narrated by Tom Tresel. They came like monsters, rather than men, into the vast ruin of what had once been a great city. They walked carefully, side by side, speaking to each other by radio, as though they were in deep space rather than upon solid ground. The winding way they followed through the ruins was marked by blurred footsteps in the dust, and the two men, clumsy in their bulky suits, found the going difficult. They stopped, and one of them held out an instrument. He studied the dial. All clear! And both men removed their helmets. They wiped sweat from their faces and glanced at each other. The blond man said, The air's okay, Jarvis. Everything seems all right. I don't get it. Jarvis, his dark eyes wary, scowled as he looked about. It seems all right, but we know it isn't. It can't be. I'm shucking this suit. Don't be a fool, Mark. But the dial read clear, man, and we know nobody is going to shoot us. All life had to be wiped out. How about minor power installations? Jarvis took a chocolate bar from his pocket, sat down on a piece of broken rubble, and began to eat. You're too careless, far too careless, Mark. Mark laughed. You've always been cautious enough for both of us. Got me out of plenty of scrapes back in school, too. Don't think I've forgotten. Affection warmed his blue eyes as they rested on the face of his friend. Okay, okay. But what happened to them? Where did they go? Jarvis took nervous bites from his second chocolate bar. Then he, too, peeled off his suit. He sniffed the air distrustfully as he wiggled the shoulders to free them from the clinging damp shirt. Then he took a few experimental steps forward. Seems all right, Mark. But how do you explain about Hank and Garland? Never were two more careful guys. Probably a simple miscalculation. Or an accident. We know it couldn't have been enemy action. Tests prove conclusively that we wiped them out to a man. He took deep gulps of air into his lungs and stretched like a cat. We'll find out soon enough. Boy, I feel great. They deflated and folded their safety suits and added the bundles to the other equipment on their backs. Then, with their instruments held before them, they probed their way into the twisted wreckage, still following the faint dust-filled footprints. Bent and rusted girders rose on all sides like the bones of prehistoric monsters. Nothing stirred. The dust lay ages thick on everything. Gives you the spooks, doesn't it? Jarvis was still tense, poised to respond to the first signal of danger. Feels like we are the last men alive. Funny about Hank and Garland, there's nothing here to harm anyone. Jarvis looked at his watch. Better contact HQ for instructions. The two stepped off the path into the shade of a grotesque chunk of broken masonry. Mark set up the radio and twirled the dials. Team 4 calling HQ. Team 4 reporting. HQ here, the voice from the radio blared loud in the stillness. Give your report, Team 4. Looks like nothing moved here for a thousand years. Safe as a baby's dream. Rock solid. Air morning pure. But... He hesitated, trying not to sound like a scare schoolboy. No sign of Team 3, or of Teams 1 and 2 either. Over. Look here, Team 4. It's your job to find out. The Earth didn't just swallow them. Final report from each team placed them well within the city. It's been ten days since the last contact. Probe every inch of the place. Right. But be careful. We can't afford to lose any more men. Roger. Roger. There was only one way now. 
ahead. It lay clearly marked. The dim footsteps never strayed or faltered. Three hours of search revealed no pitfalls, no dangers, and no trace of the missing men. Then night was upon them, and they bedded down gratefully. Strange, isn't it? The war over. The invaders blasted from the earth. All peril gone. And yet, men disappear. Jarvis stared at the ruins around them. I can't take much more, Mark. Twelve years of war is enough. Are we never to have a life? Have a home and women back? And peace? Sure, it's been tough. But think of the women and children isolated on that sub-satellite. It's tougher for them, just waiting. Stretched on his back, Mark stared at the cloudless evening sky. But pretty soon we'll get this planet cleaned up and bring them in. Christ! Four years without even seeing a woman. I remember the last time. Okay, Jarvis interrupted impatiently. Let's get to sleep. Sure, pal. Good night. They fell asleep to dreams of green hills, corn ripening, apples roasting over an open fire. Peace and home and girls, their firm legs flashing in the sun. Soldier-like, Mark was suddenly awake. He lay without motion, sensitive to some subtle change in the surroundings. From the corner of his eye he could see Jarvis wrapped in sleep. The silence seemed eternal. Then, whisper soft, came a murmur, a sound, a voice, a girl's voice, sighing and singing from deep in that devastated spot. A woman. Instantly, Mark was on his feet. No need to wake Jarvis. Plenty of time for Jarvis to find out afterwards, but not yet. A miracle that a girl had survived in all that wreckage, but a miracle he wanted to save her alone. Ahead, the path turned, and Mark followed it as it went forward again, downhill, between the massed walls of rubble. Now the voice swelled, a melancholy song. Well, she won't be melancholy for long, Mark thought. Her solitary ordeal was over. Mark! Jarvis stood on an upturned lintel, ten feet above Mark's head. As Mark jerked to a stop at the cry, Jarvis jumped into his path. You fool! Don't you know it's a trap? So that's how you want to play it? The noble friend, protecting me from myself. He slammed a fist into the side of Jarvis's head. Well, I won't bite. She's mine! I found her! In silence, in the narrow passage between the rocks, the two fought. Suddenly, above the sound of fist on flesh, came the voice of the girl again, clear, young. She is there, thought Jarvis. He could almost taste her lips on his. The sensation came as a shock. How did he know? He'd never had a woman. That's what came from listening to the tales of Marx's exploits with women. Now he had to have that girl. The mounting tension of the fighting snapped something in Jarvis's seething mind. Danger, friendship, duty, all meant nothing. Only one thing mattered. The girl. Mark had had more than his share of girls. He, Jarvis, was the one who should have her. He'd been deprived of his manhood long enough. His frenzied brain hunted a trick to gain his ends. Marx's superior strength began to force Jarvis to give ground. Then a final blow sent him reeling. He reached out to break his fall. His hand closed on a rock. He threw it. Mark crashed to the ground, his knee smashed, his leg useless. Then the tomb stillness of the dead city took over. The dust settled slowly. Mark came to his feet. Jarvis was gone. Dragging his useless leg, Mark forced himself to crawl forward. 
Jarvis had to be stopped. Ahead, a shadow moved, and for a moment the moon threw the silhouette of a man against a cavernous opening in the debris. Jarvis! An electric flash shattered the darkness. The jagged teeth of the bolt spit tongues of fire. Cordite mingled with the raw, nauseant, revolting smell of scorched flesh and hair. The figure tottered and fell into the black mouth of the cave. Then, as the flame faded, it lit up small bundles of charred bones near the fallen body. There was a whir and a click of a mechanism. Fifteen feet away, Mark watched as the arm of a phonograph rose, moved slowly back to the starting point. Then the record began once more to grind out its death trap melody. The End Subscribe for your daily stories of futures past. And now for the next story. Watchbird by Robert Sheckley Originally published in Galaxy, February 1953 Narrated by Tom Trussell When Gelson entered, he saw that the rest of the Watchbird manufacturers were already present. There were six of them, not counting himself, and the room was blue with expensive cigar smoke. "'Hi, Charlie,' one of them called as he came in. The rest broke off conversation long enough to wave a casual greeting at him. As a watchbird manufacturer, he was a member manufacturer of Salvation, he reminded himself wryly. Very exclusive. You must have a certified government contract if you want to save the human race. The government representative isn't here yet, one of the men told him. He's due any minute. We're getting the green light, another said. Fine, Gelson found a chair near the door and looked around the room. It was like a convention or a Boy Scout rally. The six men made up for their lack of numbers by sheer volume. The president of Southern Consolidated was talking at the top of his lungs about Watchbird's enormous durability. The two presidents he was talking at were grinning, nodding, one trying to interrupt with the results of a test he had run on Watchbird's resourcefulness, the others talking about the new recharging apparatus. The other three men were in their own little group, delivering what sounded like a panegyric to Watchbird. Gelson noticed that all of them stood straight and tall, like the saviours they felt they were. He didn't find it funny. Up to a few days ago he had felt that way himself. He had considered himself a pot-bellied, slightly balding saint. He sighed and lighted a cigarette. At the beginning of the project he had been as enthusiastic as the others. He remembered saying to McIntyre, his chief engineer, "'Mac, a new day is coming. Watchbird is the answer.' And McIntyre had nodded very profoundly another watchbird convert. How wonderful it had seemed then! A simple, reliable answer to one of mankind's greatest problems, all wrapped and packaged in a pound of incorruptible metal, crystal and plastics. Perhaps that was the very reason he was doubting it now. Gelson suspected that you don't solve human problems so easily. There had to be a catch somewhere. After all, murder was an old problem, and Watchbird too knew a solution. Gentlemen, they had been talking so heatedly that they hadn't noticed the government representative entering. Now the room became quiet at once. Gentlemen, the plump government man said, the President, with the consent of Congress, has acted to form a Watchbird division for every city and town in the country. The men burst into a spontaneous shout of triumph. They were going to have their chance to save the world after all, Gelson thought, and worriedly asked himself what was wrong with that. He listened carefully as a government man outlined the distribution scheme. The country was to be divided into seven areas, each to be supplied and serviced by one manufacturer. 
This meant monopoly, of course, but a necessary one. Like the telephone service, it was in the public's best interests. You couldn't have competition in Watchbird's service. Watchbird was for everyone. The President hopes, the representative continued, that full Watchbird service will be installed in the shortest possible time. You will have top priorities on strategic metals, manpower, and so forth. Speaking for myself, the President of Southern Consolidated said, I expect to have the first batch of Watchbirds distributed within the week. Production is all set up. The rest of the men were equally ready. The factories had been prepared to roll out the Watchbirds for months now. The final standardised equipment had been agreed upon, and only the presidential go-ahead had been lacking. Fine, the representative said. If that is all, I think we can. Is there a question? Yes, sir, Gelson said. I want to know if the present model is the one we're going to manufacture. Of course, the representative said. It's the most advanced. I have an objection, Gelson stood up. His colleagues were glaring coldly at him. Obviously, he was delaying the advent of the Golden Age. "'What is your objection?' the representative asked. First, let me say that I am one hundred per cent in favour of a machine to stop murder. It's been needed for a long time. I object only to the watchbird's learning circuits. They serve, in effect, to animate the machine and give it a pseudo-consciousness. I can't approve of that. But, Mr. Gelson, you yourself testified that the watchbird would not be completely efficient unless such circuits were introduced. Without them, the watchbird could stop only an estimated seventy per cent of murders. I know that, Gelson said, feeling extremely uncomfortable. I believe there might be a moral danger in allowing a machine to make decisions that are rightfully man's, he declared doggedly. "'Oh, come now, Gelson,' one of the corporation presidents said. "'It's nothing of the sort. The watchbirds will only reinforce the decisions made by honest men from the beginning of time.' "'I think that is true,' the representative agreed. "'But I can understand how Mr. Gelson feels. It is sad that we must put a human problem into the hands of a machine. Sadder still that we must have a machine enforce our laws. But I ask you to remember, Mr. Gelson,' that there is no other possible way of stopping a murderer before he strikes. It would be unfair to the many innocent people killed every year if we were to restrict Watchbird on philosophical grounds. Don't you agree that I'm right? Yes, I suppose I do, Gelson said unhappily. He had told himself all that a thousand times, but something still bothered him. Perhaps he would talk it over with McIntyre. As the conference broke up, a thought struck him. He grinned. A lot of policemen were going to be out of work. "'Now what do you think of that?' Officer Celtrix demanded. Fifteen years in homicide, and a machine is replacing me!' He wiped a large red hand across his forehead and leaned against the captain's desk. "'Ain't science marvellous!' Two other policemen— late of homicide, nodded glumly. "'Don't worry about it,' the captain said. "'We'll find a home for you in Larceny, Seltrix. You'll like it there.' "'I just can't get over it,' Seltrix complained. "'A lousy little piece of tin and glass is going to solve all the crimes.' "'Not quite,' the captain said. "'The watchbirds are supposed to prevent the crimes before they happen.' "'Then how will they be crimes?' one of the policemen asked. "'I mean, they can't hang you for murder until you commit one, can they?' "'That's not the idea,' the captain said. "'The watchbirds are supposed to stop a man before he commits a murder.' "'Then no one arrests him?' Seltrix asked. "'I don't know how they're going to work that out,' the captain admitted. The men were silent for a while. The captain yawned and examined his watch. "'The thing I don't understand,' Seltrix said, still leaning on the captain's desk, "'is just how do they do it? How did it start, captain?' The captain studied Seltrix's face for possible irony. After all, Watchbird had been in the papers for months. But then he remembered that Seltrix, like his sidekicks, 
rarely bothered to turn past the sports pages. Well, the captain said, trying to remember what he had read in the Sunday supplements, these scientists were working on criminology. They were studying murderers to find out what made them tick. So they found that murderers throw out a different sort of brain wave from ordinary people, and their glands act funny too. All this happens when they're about to commit a murder. So these scientists worked out a special machine to flash red or something when these brain waves turned on. Scientists, Seltrick said bitterly. Well, after the scientists had this machine, they didn't know what to do with it. It was too big to move around, and murderers didn't drop in often enough to make it flash. So they built it into a smaller unit and tried it out in a few police stations. I think they tried one upstate, but it didn't work so good. You couldn't get to the crime in time. That's why they built the watchbirds. I don't think they'll stop no criminals, one of the policemen insisted. They sure will. I read the test results. They can smell him out before he commits a crime. And when they reach him, they give him a powerful shock or something. It'll stop him. You closing up homicide, Captain? Seltrix asked. Nope, the captain said. I'm leaving a skeleton crew in until we see how these birds do. Ha, ah, Seltrix said. Skeleton crew, that's funny. Sure, the captain said. Anyhow, I'm going to leave some men on. It seems the birds don't stop all murders. Why not? Some murderers don't have these brain waves, the captain answered, trying to remember what the newspaper article had said. Or their glands don't work or something. Which ones don't they stop? Seltrix asked, with professional curiosity. I don't know, but I hear they got the damn things fixed, so they're going to stop all of them soon. How are they working that? They learn. The watchbirds, I mean. Just like people. You kidding me? Nope. Well, Seltrix said, I think I'll just keep old Betsy oiled, just in case. You can't trust these scientists. Right. Birds, Seltrix scoffed. Over the town, the watchbird soared in a long, lazy curve. Its aluminium hide glistened in the morning sun, and dots of light danced on its stiff wings. Silently it flew. Silently, but with all senses functioning. Built-in kinesthetics told the watchbird where it was, and held it in a long search curve, its eyes and ears operated as one unit, searching, seeking. And then something happened. The watchbird's electronically fast reflexes picked up the edge of a sensation. A correlation centre tested it, matching it with electrical and chemical data in its memory files. A relay tripped. Down the watchbird spiralled, coming in on the increasingly strong sensation. It smelled the outpouring of certain glands, tasted a deviant brainwave. Fully alerted and armed, it spun and banked in the bright morning sunlight. Dinelli was so intent he didn't see the watchbird coming. He had his gun poised, and his eyes pleaded with a big grocer. "'Don't come no grocer!' "'You lousy little punk,' the grocer said, and took another step forward. "'Rob me! I'll break every bone in your puny body!' The grocer, too stupid or too courageous to understand the threat of the gun, advanced on the little thief. "'All right,' Dinelli said in a thorough state of panic. "'All right, sucker, take!' A bolt of electricity knocked him on his back. The gun went off, smashing a breakfast food display. "'What an L?' the grocer asked, staring at the stunned thief. And then he saw a flash of silver wings. "'Well, I'm really damned. Those watchbirds work!' He stared until the wings disappeared in the sky. Then he telephoned the police. The watchbird returned to its search curve. Its thinking centre correlated the new facts he had learned about murder. Several of these he hadn't known before. This new information was simultaneously flashed to all the other watchbirds, and their information was flashed back to him. New information, methods, definitions, were constantly passing between them. Now that the watchbirds were rolling off the assembly line in a steady stream, 
Gelson allowed himself to relax. A loud, contented hum filled his plant. Orders were being filled on time, with top priorities given to the biggest cities in his area, and working down to the smallest towns. "'All smooth, Chief,' McIntyre said, coming in the door. He had just completed a routine inspection. "'Fine, have a seat.' The big engineer sat down and lighted a cigarette. "'We've been working on this for some time,' Gelson said, when he couldn't think of anything else. "'We sure have,' McIntyre agreed. He leaned back and inhaled deeply. He had been one of the consulting engineers on the original watchbird. That was six years back. He had been working for Gelson ever since, and the men had become good friends. "'The thing I wanted to ask you was this,' Gelson paused. He couldn't think how to phrase what he wanted. Instead he asked, "'What do you think of the watchbirds, Mac?' "'Who, me?' the engineer grinned nervously. He had been eating, drinking, and sleeping watchbird ever since its inception. He had never found it necessary to have an attitude. "'Why, I think it's great!' "'You don't mean that,' Gelson said. He realised that what he wanted was to have someone understand his point of view. "'I mean, do you figure there might be some danger in machine thinking?' "'I don't think so, Chief. Why do you ask?' Look, I'm no scientist or engineer. I've just handled cost and production and let you boys worry about how. But as a layman, Watchbird is starting to frighten me. No reason for that. I don't like the idea of the learning circuits. But why not? Then McIntyre grinned again. I know. You're like a lot of people, Chief. Afraid your machines are going to wake up and say, What are we doing here? Let's go out and rule the world. Is that it? Maybe something like that, Gelson admitted. No chance of it, McIntyre said. The watchbirds are complex, I'll admit, but an MIT calculator is a whole lot more complex, and it hasn't got consciousness. No, but the watchbirds can learn. Sure, so can all the new calculators. Do you think they'll team up with the watchbirds? Gelson felt annoyed at McIntyre, and even more annoyed at himself for being ridiculous. It's a fact that the watchbirds can put their learning into action. No one is monitoring them. So that's the trouble, McIntyre said. I've been thinking of getting out of Watchbird. Gelson hadn't realised it until that moment. Look, Chief, McIntyre said, will you take an engineer's word on this? Let's hear it. The watchbirds are no more dangerous than an automobile, an IBM calculator, or a thermometer. They have no more consciousness or volition than those things. The watchbirds are built to respond to certain stimuli, and to carry out certain operations when they receive that stimuli. And the learning circuits? You have to have those, McIntyre said patiently, as though explaining the whole thing to a ten-year-old. The purpose of the watchbird is to frustrate all murder attempts, right? Well, only certain murderers give out these stimuli. In order to stop all of them, the watchbird has to search out new definitions of murder and correlate them with what it already knows. I think it's inhuman, Gelson said. That's the best thing about it. The watchbirds are unemotional. Their reasoning is non-anthropomorphic. You can't bribe them or drug them. You shouldn't fear them either. The intercom on Gelson's desk buzzed. He ignored it. "'I know all this,' Gelson said. "'But, still, sometimes I feel like the man who invented dynamite. He thought it would only be used for blowing up tree stumps.' "'You didn't invent Watchbird.' "'I still feel morally responsible because I manufacture them.' The intercom buzzed again, and Gelson irritably punched a button. The reports are in on the first week of watchbird operation, his secretary told him. How do they look? Wonderful, sir. Send them in in fifteen minutes. Gelson switched the intercom off and turned back to McIntyre, who was cleaning his fingernails with a wooden match. Don't you think that this represents a trend in human thinking? The mechanical god? The electronic father? Chief, McIntyre said. 
I think you should study Watchbird more closely. Do you know what's built into the circuits? Only generally. First, there is a purpose, which is to stop living organisms from committing murder. Two, murder may be defined as an act of violence, consisting of breaking, mangling, maltreating, or otherwise stopping the functions of a living organism by a living organism. Three, most murderers are detectable by certain chemical and electrical changes. McIntyre paused to light another cigarette. Those conditions take care of the routine functions. Then, for the learning circuits, there are two more conditions. Four, there are some living organisms who commit murder without the signs mentioned in three. Five, these can be detected by data applicable to condition two. I see, Gelson said. You realise how foolproof this is? I suppose so, Gelson hesitated a moment. I guess that's all. Right, the engineer said, and left. Gelson thought for a few moments. There couldn't be anything wrong with the watchbirds. Send in the reports, he said into the intercom. High above the lighted buildings of the city, the watchbird soared. It was dark, but in the distance the watchbird could see another and another beyond that, for this was a large city. To prevent murder. There was more to watch for now. New information had crossed the invisible network that connected all watchbirds. New data, new ways of detecting the violence of murder. There, the edge of a sensation. Two watchbirds dipped simultaneously. One had received the centre fraction of a second before the other. He continued down while the other resumed monitoring. Condition four. There are some living organisms who commit murder without the signs mentioned in condition three. Through this new information, the watchbird knew by extrapolation that this organism was bent on murder, even though the characteristic chemical and electrical smells were absent. The watchbird, all senses acute, closed in on the organism. He found what he wanted, and dived. Roger Greco leaned against a building, his hands in his pockets. In his left hand was a cool butt of a point forty five. Greco waited patiently. He wasn't thinking of anything in particular, just relaxing against a building, waiting for a man. Greco didn't know why the man was to be killed. He didn't care. Greco's lack of curiosity was part of his value. The other part was his skill. One bullet, neatly placed in the head of a man he didn't know. It didn't excite him or sicken him. It was a job, just like anything else. You killed a man, so? As Greco's victim stepped out of a building, Greco lifted the point forty five out of his pocket. He released the safety and braced the gun with his right hand. He still wasn't thinking of anything as he took aim, and was knocked off his feet. Greco thought he had been shot. He struggled up again, looked around, and sighted foggily on his victim. Again he was knocked down. This time he lay on the ground, trying to draw a bead. He never thought of stopping, for Greco was a craftsman. With the next blow, everything went black, permanently, because the watchbird's duty was to protect the object of violence, at whatever cost to the murderer. The victim walked to his car. He hadn't noticed anything unusual. Everything had happened in silence. Gelson was feeling pretty good. The watchbirds had been operating perfectly. Crimes of violence had been cut in half and cut again. Dark alleys were no longer mouths of horror. Parks and playgrounds were not places to shun after dusk. Of course, there were still robberies. Petty thievery flourished, and embezzlement, larceny, forgery, and a hundred other crimes. But that wasn't so important. You could regain lost money, never a lost life. Gelson was ready to admit that he had been wrong about the watchbirds. 
They were doing a job that humans had been unable to accomplish. The first hint of something wrong came that morning. McIntyre came into his office. He stood silently in front of Gelson's desk, looking annoyed and a little embarrassed. "'What's the matter, Mac?' Gelson asked. "'One of the watchbirds went to work on a slaughterhouse man, knocked him out.' Gelson thought about it for a moment. "'Yes, the watchbirds would do that. With their new learning circuits they'd probably define the killing of animals as murder.' "'Tell the packers to mechanise their slaughtering,' Gelson said. "'I never liked that business myself.' "'All right,' McIntyre said. He pursed his lips, then shrugged his shoulders and left. Gelson stood beside his desk, thinking. "'Couldn't the watchbirds differentiate between a murderer and a man engaged in a legitimate profession?' "'No, evidently not. "'To them, murder was murder.' no exceptions. He frowned. That might take a little ironing out in the circuits. But not too much, he decided hastily. Just make them a little more discriminating. He sat down again and buried himself in paperwork, trying to avoid the edge of an old fear. They strapped the prisoner into the chair and fitted the electrode to his leg. Oh, oh, he moaned, only half conscious now of what they were doing. They fitted the helmet over his shaved head and tightened the last straps. He continued to moan softly. And then the watchbird swept in. How he had come, no one knew. Prisons are large and strong with many locked doors, but the watchbird was there to stop a murder. "'Get that thing out of here!' the warden shouted, and reached for the switch. The watchbird knocked him down. "'Stop that!' a guard screamed, and grabbed for the switch himself. He was knocked to the floor beside the warden. "'This isn't murder, you idiot!' another guard said. He drew his gun to shoot down the glittering, wheeling metal bird. Anticipating, the watchbird smashed him back against the wall. There was silence in the room. After a while, the man in the helmet started to giggle. Then he stopped. The watchbird stood on guard, fluttering in mid-air, making sure no murder was done. New data flashed along the watchbird network, unmonitored, independent. The thousands of watchbirds received and acted upon it. The breaking, mangling, or otherwise stopping the functions of a living organism by a living organism. New acts to stop. "'Damn you, get going!' Farmer Alister shouted and raised his whip again. The horse balked, and the wagon rattled and shook as he edged sideways. "'You lousy hunk of pigmail! Get going!' The farmer yelled, and he raised the whip again. It never fell. An alert watchbird, sensing violence, had knocked him out of his seat. A living organism. What is a living organism? The watchbirds extended their definitions as they became aware of more facts. And, of course, this gave them more work. The deer was just visible at the edge of the woods. The hunter raised his rifle and took careful aim. He didn't have time to shoot. With his free hand, Gelson mopped perspiration from his face. "'All right,' he said into the telephone. He listened to the stream of vituperation from the other end, then placed the receiver gently in its cradle. "'What was that one?' McIntyre asked. He was unshaven, tied loose, shirt unbuttoned. "'Another fisherman,' Gelson said. "'It seems the watchbirds won't let him fish, even though his family is starving.' "'What are we going to do about it?' he wants to know. "'How many hundred is that?' "'I don't know. I haven't opened the mail.' "'Well, I've figured out where the trouble is,' McIntyre said gloomily, with the air of a man who knows just how he blew up the earth, after it was too late. "'Let's hear it. "'Everybody took it for granted that we wanted all murder stopped. "'We figured the watchbirds would think as we do. 
We ought to have qualified the conditions. I've got an idea, Gelson said, that we'd have to know just why and what murder is before we could qualify the conditions properly, and if we knew that, we wouldn't need the watchbirds. Oh, I don't know about that. They just have to be told that some things which look like murder are not murder. But why should they stop fishermen? Gelson asked. Why shouldn't they? Fish and animals are living organisms. We just don't think that killing them is murder. The telephone rang. Gelson glared at it and punched the intercom. I told you no more calls, no matter what. This is from Washington, his secretary said. I thought you'd— Sorry, Gelson picked up the telephone. Yes, certain is a mess. Have they? All right, I certainly will. He put down the telephone. Short and sweet, he told McIntyre. We're to shut down temporarily. That won't be so easy, McIntyre said. The watchbirds operate independent of any central control, you know. They come back once a week for a repair check-up. We'll have to turn them off then, one by one. Well, let's get to it. Monroe over on the coast has shut down about a quarter of his birds. I think I can dope out a restricting circuit, McIntyre said. Fine, Gelson replied bitterly. You make me very happy. The watchbirds were learning rapidly, expanding and adding to their knowledge. Loosely defined abstractions were extended, acted upon, and re-extended to stop murder. Metal and electrons reason well, but not in a human fashion. A living organism? Any living organism! The watchbirds set themselves the task of protecting all living things. The fly buzzed around the room, lighting on a tabletop, pausing a moment, then darting to a window sill. The old man stalked it, a rolled newspaper in hand. Murderer! The watchbird swept down and saved the fly in the nick of time. The old man writhed on the floor a minute, and then was silent. He had been given only a mild shock, but it had been enough for his fluttery, cranky heart. His victim had been saved, though, and this was the important thing. Save the victim, and give the aggressor his just deserts. Gelson demanded angrily, Why aren't they being turned off? The assistant control engineer gestured. In a corner of the repair room lay the senior control engineer. He was just regaining consciousness. He tried to turn one of them off, the assistant engineer said. Both of his hands were knotted together. He was making a visible effort not to shake. That's ridiculous. They haven't got any sense of self-preservation. Then turn them off yourself. Besides, I don't think any more are going to come. What could have happened? Gelson began to piece it together. The watchbird still hadn't decided on the limits of a living organism. When some of them were turned off in the Monroe plant, the rest must have correlated the data. So they had been forced to assume that they were living organisms as well. No one had ever told them otherwise. Certainly they carried on most of the functions of living organisms. Then the old fears hit him. Gelson trembled and hurried out of the repair room. He wanted to find McIntyre in a hurry. The nurse handed the surgeon the sponge. Scalpel! She placed it in his hand. He started to make the first incision and then he was aware of a disturbance. "'Who let that thing in?' "'I don't know,' the nurse said, her voice muffled by the mask. "'Get it out of here!' The nurse waved her arms at the bright winged things, but it fluttered over her head. The surgeon proceeded with the incision, as long as he was able. The watchbird drove him away and stood guard. "'Telephone the watchbird company,' the surgeon ordered. Get them to turn the thing off. The watchbird was preventing violence to a living organism. The surgeon stood by helplessly while his patient died. 
Fluttering high above the network of highways, the watchbird watched and waited. It had been constantly working for weeks now, without rest or repair. Rest and repair were impossible, because the watchbird couldn't allow itself, a living organism, to be murdered. And that was what happened when watchbirds returned to the factory. There was a built-in order to return, after the lapse of a certain time period, but the watchbird had a stronger order to obey, preservation of life, including its own. The definitions of murder were almost infinitely extended now, impossible to cope with, but the watchbird didn't consider that. It responded to its stimuli whenever they came and whatever their source. There was a new definition of living organism in its memory files. It had come as a result of the watchbird discovery that watchbirds were living organisms, and it had enormous ramifications. The stimuli came. For the hundredth time that day, the bird wheeled and banked, dropping swiftly down to stop murder. Jackson yawned and pulled his car to a shoulder of the road. He didn't notice the glittering dot in the sky. There was no reason for him to. Jackson wasn't contemplating murder by any human definition. There was a good spot for a nap, he decided. He had been driving for seven straight hours and his eyes were starting to fog. He reached out to turn off the ignition key and was knocked back against the side of the car. "'What in hell's wrong with you?' he asked indignantly. "'All I want to do is—' He reached for the key again, and again he was smacked back. Jackson knew better than to try a third time. He had been listening to the radio, and he knew what the watchbirds did to stubborn violators. "'You mechanical jerk!' he said to the waiting metal bird. "'A car's not alive. I'm not trying to kill it.' But the watchbird only knew that a certain operation resulted in stopping an organism. The car was certainly a functioning organism. Wasn't it of metal, as were the watchbirds? Didn't it run? McIntyre said, Without repairs they'll run down. He shoved a pile of specification sheets out of his way. How soon? Gelson asked. Six months to a year. Say a year, barring accidents. A year, Gelson said. In the meantime, everything is stopping dead. Do you know the latest? What? The watchbirds have decided that the earth is a living organism. They won't allow farmers to break ground for ploughing. And, of course, everything else is a living organism. Rabbits, beetles, flies, wolves, mosquitoes, lions, crocodiles, crows, and smaller forms of life such as bacteria. I know. McIntyre said. And you tell me they'll wear out in six months or a year. What happens now? What are we going to eat in six months? The engineer rubbed his chin. We'll have to do something quick and fast. Ecological balance is gone to hell. Fast isn't the word. Instantaneously would be better. Gelson lighted his thirty-fifth cigarette for the day. At least I have the bitter satisfaction of saying, I told you so, although I'm just as responsible as the rest of the machine-worshipping fools. McIntyre wasn't listening. He was thinking about watchbirds. Like the rabbit plague in Australia. The death rate is mounting, Gelson said. Famine, floods, can't cut down trees, doctors can't. What was that you said about Australia? The rabbits, McIntyre repeated. Hardly any left in Australia now. Why? How was it done? Oh, found some kind of germ that attacked only rabbits. I think it was propagated by mosquitoes. Work on that, Gelson said. You might have something. I want you to get on the telephone, ask for an emergency hook-up with engineers of the other companies. Hurry it up. Together you may be able to dope out something. Right, McIntyre said. He grabbed a handful of blank paper and hurried to the telephone. "'What did I tell you?' Officer Seltrick said. He grinned at the captain. "'Didn't I tell you scientists were nuts?' "'I didn't say you were wrong, did I?' the captain asked. 
"'No, but you weren't sure.' "'Well, I'm sure now. "'You'd better get going. "'There's plenty of work for you.' "'I know.' Seltrix drew his revolver from its holster, "'checked it, and put it back. "'Are all the boys back, Captain?' "'All?' "'The Captain laughed humorously. "'Homicide has increased by fifty per cent. "'There's more murder now than there's ever been.' "'Sure,' Seltrix said. "'The watchbirds are too busy guarding cars and slugging spiders.' He started toward the door, then turned for a parting shot. "'Take my word, Captain. Machines are stupid!' the captain nodded. Thousands of watchbirds trying to stop countless millions of murders. A hopeless task. But the watchbirds didn't hope. Without consciousness they experienced no sense of accomplishment, no fear or failure. Patiently they went about their jobs, obeying each stimulus as it came. They couldn't be everywhere at the same time, but it wasn't necessary to be. People learned quickly what the watchbirds didn't like, and refrained from doing it. It just wasn't safe. With their high speed and super-fast senses, the watchbirds got around quickly. And now they meant business. In their original directives there had been a provision made for killing a murderer, if all other means failed. Why spare a murderer? It backfired. The watchbirds extracted the fact that murder and crimes of violence had increased geometrically since they had begun operation. This was true, because their new definitions increased the possibilities of murder. But to the watchbirds, the rise showed that the first methods had failed. Simple logic. If A doesn't work, try B. The watchbirds shocked to kill. Slaughterhouses in Chicago stopped, and cattle starved to death in their pens because farmers in the Midwest couldn't cut hay or harvest grain. No one had told the watchbirds that all life depends on carefully balanced murders. Starvation didn't concern the watchbirds, since it was an act of omission. Their interest lay only in acts of commission. Hunters sat home, glaring at the silver dots in the sky, longing to shoot them down. But for the most part they didn't try. The watchbirds were quick to sense the murder intent, and to punish it. Fishing boats swung idle at their moorings in San Pedro and Gloucester. Fish were living organisms. Farmers cursed and spat and died, trying to harvest the crop. Grain was alive, and thus worthy of protection. Potatoes were as important to the watchbird as any other living organism. The death of a blade of grass was equal to the assassination of a president. To the watchbirds. And, of course, certain machines were living. This followed, since the watchbird were machines, and living. God help you if you maltreated your radio. Turning it off meant killing it. Obviously, its voice was silenced. The red glow of its tubes faded. It grew cold. The watchbirds tried to guard their other charges. Wolves were slaughtered trying to kill rabbits. Rabbits were electrocuted trying to eat vegetables. Creepers were burned out in the act of strangling trees. A butterfly was executed, caught in the act of outraging a rose. This control was spasmodic, because of the fewness of the watchbirds. A billion watchbirds couldn't have carried out the ambitious project set by the thousands. The effect was of a murderous force, ten thousand bolts of irrational lightning raging around the country, striking a thousand times a day. Lightning which anticipated your moves, and punished your intentions. "'Gentlemen, please,' the government representative begged. "'We must hurry.' The seven manufacturers stopped talking. "'Before we begin this meeting formally,' the president of Monroe said, "'I want to say something. We do not feel ourselves responsible for this unhappy state of affairs. It was a government project. The government must accept the responsibility, both moral and financial.' Gelson shrugged his shoulders. It was hard to believe that these men, just a few weeks ago, had been willing to accept the glory of saving the world. 
Now they wanted to shrug off the responsibility when the salvation went amiss. "'I'm positive that that need not concern us now,' the representative assured him. "'We must hurry. You engineers have done an excellent job. I am proud of the cooperation you have shown in this emergency. You are hereby empowered to put the outlined plan into action.' "'Wait a minute,' Gelson said. "'There is no time. The plan's no good.' "'Don't you think it will work?' "'Of course it will work, but I'm afraid the cure will be worse than the disease.' The manufacturers looked as though they would have enjoyed throttling Gelson. He didn't hesitate. "'Haven't we learned yet?' he asked. "'Don't you see that you can't cure human problems by mechanization? "'Mr. Gelson,' the President of Monroe said, "'I should enjoy hearing you philosophize, but unfortunately people are being killed.' Crops are being ruined. There is famine in some sections of the country already. The watchbirds must be stopped at once. Murder must be stopped too. I remember all of us agreeing upon that. But this is not the way. What would you suggest? the representative asked. Gelson took a deep breath. What he was about to say took all the courage he had. Let the watchbirds run down by themselves. Gelson suggested. There was a near riot. The government representative broke it up. "'Let's take our lesson,' Gelson urged. "'Admit that we were wrong trying to cure human problems by mechanical means. Start again. Use machines, yes, but not as judges and teachers and fathers.' "'Ridiculous,' the representative said coldly. "'Mr. Gelson, you are overwrought.' I suggest you control yourself. He cleared his throat. All of you are ordered by the President to carry out the plan you have submitted. He looked sharply at Gelson. Not to do so will be treason. I'll cooperate to the best of my ability, Gelson said. Good. Those assembly lines must be rolling within the week. Gelson walked out of the room alone. Now he was confused again. Had he been right, or was it just another visionary? Certainly he hadn't explained himself with much clarity. Did he know what he meant? Gelson cursed under his breath. He wondered why he couldn't ever be sure of anything. Weren't there any values he could hold on to? He hurried to the airport and to his plant. The watchbird was operating erratically now. Many of its delicate parts were out of line, worn by almost continuous operation. But gallantly it responded when the stimuli came. A spider was attacking a fly. The watchbird swooped down to the rescue. Simultaneously it became aware of something overhead. The watchbird wheeled to meet it. There was a sharp crackle, and a power bolt whizzed by the watchbird's wing. Angrily, it spat a shock wave. The attacker was heavily insulated. Again it spat at the watchbird. This time a bolt smashed through a wing. The watchbird darted away, but the attacker went after it in a burst of speed, throwing out more crackling power. The watchbird fell, but managed to send out its message. Urgent! A new menace to living organisms, and this was the deadliest yet! Other watchbirds around the country integrated the message. The thinking centres searched for an answer. "'Well, Chief, they bagged fifty today,' McIntyre said, coming into Gelson's office. "'Fine,' Gelson said, not looking at the engineer. "'Not so fine,' McIntyre sat down. "'Lord, I'm tired. It was seventy-two yesterday.' "'I know.' On Gelson's desk were several dozen lawsuits, which he was sending to the government with a prayer. "'They'll pick up again, though,' McIntyre said confidently. "'The hawks are especially built to hunt down watchbirds. They're stronger, faster, and they've got better armour. We really rolled them out in a hurry, huh?' "'We sure did.' "'The watchbirds are pretty good, too,' McIntyre had to admit. "'They're learning to take cover. They're trying a lot of stunts.' You know, each one that goes down tells the others something. Gelson didn't answer. 
"'But anything the watchbirds can do, the hawks can do better,' McIntyre said cheerfully. "'The hawks have special learning circuits for hunting. They're more flexible than the watchbirds. They learn faster.' Gelson gloomily stood up, stretched, and walked to the window. The sky was blank. Looking out, he realised that his uncertainties were over. Right or wrong, he had made up his mind. "'Tell me,' he said, still watching the sky, "'what will the hawks hunt after they get all the watchbirds?' "'Huh?' McIntyre said. "'Why?' "'Just to be on the safe side.' You'd better design something to hunt down the hawks. Just in case, I mean. You think? All I know is that the hawks are self-controlled. So were the watchbirds. Remote control would have been too slow, the argument went on. The idea was to get the watchbirds and get them fast. That meant no restricting circuits. We can dope something out, McIntyre said uncertainly. "'You've got an aggressive machine up in the air now. "'A murder machine. "'Before that it was an anti-murder machine. "'Your next gadget will have to be even more self-sufficient, won't it?' "'McIntyre didn't answer. "'I don't hold you responsible,' Gelson said. "'It's me. It's everyone.' "'In the air outside was a swift-moving dot.' "'That's what comes,' said Gelson, "'of giving a machine the job that was our own responsibility. "'Overhead, a hawk was zeroing in on a watchbird. "'The armoured murder machine had learned a lot in a few days. "'Its sole function was to kill. "'At present it was impelled toward a certain type of living organism, "'metallic like itself. "'But the hawk had just discovered that there were other types of living organisms too, which had to be murdered. The End Subscribe for your daily stories of futures past. You know, many of these stories were written in a time where 50 years ago was in the future.